My name is Melissa Dalton, and I'm a fellow and the chief of staff here at the International Security Program at CSIS. Before we begin to get today, I wanted to share with you some of our building safety precautions. We, of course, feel quite safe and secure here at, at CSIS, but as a convener, we have a responsibility to apprise you of some of the instructions in the event of an emergency situation. I will serve as your responsible service officer in the event of uh, an emergency. So should the need arise, please follow my instructions and I will guide you safely out of the meeting area. Finally, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the emergency exit that is directly behind you. Um, the way that you came in, you'd proceed out through the lobby and out through the front doors um, is, is the main way to exit the, the premises. And now I'd like to introduce Admiral Peter Daly, the Chief Executive Officer of the United States Naval Institute, our partner for the Maritime Security Dialogue, to introduce our speaker and to kick off today's event. Um, good afternoon. Um, we're very eager to get into this phase of this great partnership between the Naval Institute and CSIS. Um, we're very proud to have uh, Mike Connor here, commander of the submarine force. Vice Admiral Connor's had that job since 2012. Obviously, he's commanded at all levels. He served on four different submarines, then commanded Seawolf SSN 21. He also went on to command Submarine Squadron 8 and Submarine Group 7 in Japan. And uh, I think probably most of the people in this uh, audience understand what that means, but Submarine Group 7 is the most forward, the most uh, strategically and operationally important group command that we have. And at the time, his responsibilities covered the submarines operating in the Western Pacific and the submarines operating in the Central Command, uh, Arabian Gulf, um, areas of responsibility. Um, we are very proud to have him here, as I mentioned, and his shore tours, you know, I could go through a whole list I think you're, most of you are familiar with his bios, but I think the most important one to mention is that he was previously the director in the OPNAV staff for the submarine programs N87, now N97, and uh, in that role, he really looked at the future and the programming for the submarine force, but now, since 2012, has had to implement it. So we're eager to hear his perspective, and we welcome Vice Admiral Mike Connor. Well, thank you, Pete, for that kind introduction. And uh, what I'd like to do for the next, oh, 20 to 30 minutes at the most, is, is walk you through a general overview of our strategy for how we acquire and how we employ submarines uh, going forward. And uh, we believe very strongly that it's a, 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 a good, healthy strategy. Uh, it imposes cost on our adversaries. It enables other parts of our Navy, Navy and our military, and, and makes us all uh, very much more effective. So it's not a uh, submariners out doing their own thing for their own reason. It's submarines that are enabling the joint force. So with that, if you go to the next slide there, Justin. And uh, obviously you can see uh, the slides here or on the sides. And there are basically uh, six major lines of operation to the strategy. And I'm, I'm going to start in the center and then work my way around uh, this diagram we're talking about. Uh, but the first, and we'll talk about these things in detail, but, the, but for starters, it's all about owning the best platforms because submarines operate in this very ambiguous world and the superiority of the platforms from which you operate are what enables everything else because it's all about having capability, knowing you've got the capability and having your adversary always wondering what capability you really have and where you might be employing it. So we start with the best platforms. Uh, there are parallels for that in, in surface and in, in aviation, uh, some of which we rely on very heavily in the ASW world. But uh, anyway, that's, so that's tenant number one. Uh, tenant number two is, 
is that we are a, a high demand, low density asset. You'd like? Uh, we call um, uh, beat the enemy system. You know, we're in a little bit of a uh, fortuitous uh, position today in the submarine force because as everyone talks about anti-access and area denial uh, issues that others have, um, the biggest impediment to where one of our submarines can go and project power from today is this thing called the 20 fathom curve. And uh, outside of that, there, there, are, there are very few places that we can't get to and very few places that we don't go to uh, whenever we want to. So the issue in the, in the near term isn't so much where can we go, it's what can we do when we get there. But in the future, uh, we have intelligent adversaries and we fully expect that they will attempt to extend anti-access area denial below the surface of the water. And so it's important for us that we anticipate that that is coming, that we be ready for that to come. In fact, that we hope that it comes, believe it or not, because someone who's trying to do A2AD against a submarine force is gonna spend a lot of money. And it's our sincerest hope that they do. And then after they do, that we will take their investment and make it essentially uh, uh, irrelevant or worse, make it something that we can use against them. Uh, moving to the lower right, uh, that aspect of our strategy, we call it protect our strategic assets. And what we define as a strategic asset uh, varies uh, depending on the world situation uh, and the, maybe even the tactical situation. It might be ensuring that a strike group, carrier strike group, uh, is not vulnerable to torpedo attack from an enemy submarine because we attain uh, near perfect knowledge in the relatively small area around the strike group from which the enemy can launch a torpedo. And, and then we force him uh, into the sort of more generic, uh, if you want to attack our surface assets, you have to use missiles to do that, which means he gets a smaller warhead and we, sort of, and we reduce it to within the overall integrated air and missile defense problem. But a strategic asset might be something else. It might be uh, uh, one of our SSBN patrol areas that we wanna have, continue to have the confidence that we have today that those uh, ships are invulnerable. It might be undersea infrastructure. I uh, think oil and gas and increasingly think uh, transoceanic fiber and think about the economic penalty we, we would pay if, if those types of communications were interrupted uh, by an adversary either during war or during the road to war. Um, there are a lot of scholars in here. There's some great uh, work done by a professor from the, uh, from the Army Staff College out in Fort Leavenworth where he talks about this Russian strategy of uh, strategic operations to defeat critical infrastructure targets. And, uh, and they're putting a lot of thought into things like, you know, power infrastructure, uh, oil and gas infrastructure, and communications infrastructure. And some of the key nodes in those systems uh, reside uh, under the ocean. So we need to look at, at how we uh, ensure the continuity in, in those areas. Uh, in the lower left, we talk about getting on the same page. Uh, you know, we have our own unique set of information that we use in the undersea. Some of it comes from our, our submarines themselves. Some comes from these integrated uh, undersea surveillance systems. Uh, some comes from satellites and surface ships and so forth. Uh, some of it's actually unclassified and comes from things like the uh, you know, the uh, automatic identification system, the AIS system that a 
lot of the merchant traffic uses. And our challenge is, is how do we integrate all of this in one picture and have everyone that we talk to uh, during a time of conflict be, be sharing the same picture. And it, it sounds like it's easy, especially if you have, got, have your, your, uh, you know, your Google map and you can turn on the traffic and the roads and all that. Um, to do something that simple across the many uh, classification and programmatic boundaries that we wrestle uh, in, in the DOD is, is a lot harder than turning on your, 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 the streets and your Google. And, uh, and what is of particular frustration to me as I go out and seek industry help solving problems like this is that I talk to people and they say, well, we kind of have something that does that. But they do it for you know, a three-letter agency or something like that and, and not for us. And so to know that, that, that uh, doing that sort of thing is, uh, could be done very easily if we could overcome the administrative and programmatic boundaries uh, is we can do a lot better. Which leads to the final uh, line of effort which is written across the back there, get faster. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the specific uh, programs and technologies and that sort of thing that we use. But at the end of the day, you know, 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, it, we won't win or lose based on any one specific program or capability we develop. We will win or we will lose based on the pace at which we can introduce new capabilities on our side that change the game plan, <coughs> as well as uh, react to things that the adversary does. And we live in a world right now where the technology cycle runs two to three years. And we navigate a world in which the acquisition cycle runs between about six and 20 years. And you can't win in a three-year technology cycle if it takes you 20 years to implement an idea. And I really need help from people, from influential people like you to persuade the system through which we acquire what we use and open up the boundaries of programs, open up the definitions of milestones and that sort of thing so that we can stay as adaptable on the front line as the tech, pace of technology would allow us to do. Uh, that is hugely important. And we're either going to solve that and win, or we're not going to solve that, and we're going to lose. OK, next slide, please. So what does owning the best platforms mean to us? In our case, it means continuing this very successful program called the Virginia Class Submarine that Senator Warner helped us put together. Um, it is the best. Uh, submarine in the world, uh, clearly demonstrated to be so against all comers, I might say, and, uh, and we need to make it even better. And we need to make it better by taking this wonderful platform and improving its payload capacity so that we can carry a lot of the other technologies that we're developing into the places that they're needed. And uh, we're proud of what we have done so far. It, it is, to my knowledge, the only major acquisition program in the entire Department of Defense that consistently delivers on time and under budget, or I say ahead of schedule and under budget. And uh, while we're proud of that, um, we're a little bit nervous because uh, success sometimes uh, leads to complacency. And we're raising the rate at which we deliver the ships. And frankly, we fully understand that if we don't continue to deliver with that type of budget and schedule performance, that maybe a lot of the friends that we have that support us in delivering those things right now, that maybe they won't be with us. So we can't afford to get sloppy. And while we continue to deliver that platform, uh, we need to make it better through this thing we call the Virginia Payload Module, which will give us that additional capacity whether that be for Tomahawk missiles or whatever follows a Tomahawk, uh, whether it be for large diameter unmanned undersea vehicles and, and so forth. 
Uh, there's a whole bunch of things coming that we need to be ready and adaptable enough to handle. And then we need to make it even better in its acoustic performance. It's very, very good right now, but we have some uh, formidable adversaries uh, coming down the line. And we now understand that we have the physics and the processing capacity to make the next great leap in sonar. And we're going to do that, starting with the uh, USS South Dakota. And then the other big program in the lower left, and the, uh, I guess the size of the, uh, of, of the picture reflects the size of the program, we're going to start recapitalizing our SSBN force, which is the backbone of the naval leg of the strategic triad. And we're going to build uh, 12 ships. We're in the uh, technology development phase now. We're going to start bending metal in 2021, and we're going to we're going to build uh, we're going to replace the current fleet of 14 uh, with a fleet of 12, and it it will be a significant investment. It's a bill that comes around once every 40 years, and it has fallen upon our generation. The 40 years is up, and, and it's time to build that, and, and we will. Okay, next slide. So I'd like to talk now about, now that we're past the, the platforms, talk about how we make each one more valuable. And so this is the Grow Longer Arms piece, and there's, a, there's an underwater component to that and an above water component. The underwater component is to increase the effective range of our torpedoes from the 10 or so miles that we have today and get that out past 100 miles. 100 mile torpedo. I, uh, I challenged some folks to come up with a propulsion uh, method to do that and, uh, and we found it. And then someone else came to us with a propulsion method that will get us to about 200 miles, which is good. So what happens when you have a 100 or 200 mile torpedo? Well, you start thinking about it. Your, your whole picture of the world changes when you do that. You, start, you stop thinking in terms of what is the bearing and range from my ship to the target, and you start thinking a lot more, uh, start thinking in terms of geographic coordinates. And the bosses that we work for start thinking of torpedoes as underwater tomahawks because they can go to the appointed place in time, appointed place at the appointed time, uh, they can be potentially redirected. And although it's our job to get them to the fight, we might easily hand over the terminal homing of one of our torpedoes to somebody else who happens to have better information at the time that that torpedo is, is going to do the last leg of its journey. It, it's pretty exciting stuff. It, it creates all types of new opportunities for us to uh, integrate this torpedo weapon system with other uh, forces, uh, especially our, our brothers in the strike groups, uh, but maybe even beyond that. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. But in, in between those two things, there's another thing that we call, uh, what we, first of all, we call what we do today, we're calling it the lead bullet. Yeah, it's about 10 miles. And then we're calling this next step up is about we call it the silver bullet, and that is shooting things over the horizon from your submarine without any outside assistance using an unmanned air vehicle, a very inexpensive unmanned air vehicle that you launch from your own ship that looks over the horizon and it tells you what's going on, lets you meet all those rules of engagement so that you know you're engaging the one you want to and no one else. And again, another very uh, promising technology that has been demonstrated already. And then we call this very long range weapon a, uh, the golden bullet, which given that it's geographically driven, uh, isn't restricted to open water. It can go in the harbor, it can go up the river, um, it can knock on the door of the tunnel that has whatever the tunnel might have. So there's a, a lot of things we can do with that. And with that, we'll go to the, I'm sorry, let's, let's go above the water line. Um, most of the ordnance that we've used in the last 20, 30 years has been the Tomahawk land attack missile. 
And uh, many folks, including my buddy Jim Colgury in the back there, remembers when we carried the Tomahawk anti-ship missile. And we always knew that that missile, if we shot it, we knew it would hit something. We just didn't know what it would hit. <laughs> and, and that was because we had a, we had a, uh, a missile whose whose uh, kinetic range was greater than the range at which we could effectively command and control. But our ability to command and control has improved dramatically since then. Uh, what we haven't done is acquired the weapon to, to allow us to, to utilize that. So we're looking in terms of a, uh, a multi-mission weapon that can be used against a land target or a target at sea. And that's very important to the submarine force because you know, we can't decide before we leave San Diego what fight we're gonna fight. And we have to be able to adapt from one fight to the other. And there's uh, work going on right now to, to take some of the, the technology exists to add for a small cost a, a uh, anti-surface ship capability to our land attack missiles. Uh, so what's so important about that? You know, the bomb's not all that big compared to a, to, a, uh, to a torpedo. But here's what it does. It forces an adversary who thinks that he might have a submarine somewhere within 1,000 miles of him. He has to adopt an air defense posture. And therefore, he has to carry defensive weapons. And every slot he fills with a defensive weapon he will not be filling with an offensive weapon. Furthermore, he has to maintain air defense radars up, and that helps all of us in a variety of ways to track where he is. And if he wants to do that at a sophisticated level between ships, he has to maintain data links up to keep all his ships on the same page. And that provides all kinds of other opportunities for us to do things uh, that are very difficult to defend against. So it's not just the kinetic piece, it's the, it's the ambiguity of where is the submarine versus what could he do to me. This is how we take these things together to in really increase our deterrent value uh, and also our kinetic capabilities in, in time of war. Next slide, please. Okay, we call this piece Beat the Adversary System. And, uh, you know, if, if we had anticipated anti-access area denial with some years of foresight, we probably would have done a few things differently. So as we stand here today and as we look at, at uh, anti-access area denial potentially going under sea, uh, we have a brief window of time in which we can prepare for that. And we're using that window of time. And, and the goal is very simple. It is as the adversaries invest in their ability to find submarines through acoustic means, optical means, radar means, and so forth, we will provide him with many, many things that look very, very good on, on their equipment. And, uh, and we will put them, after the investment is done, right back in the same position where they are today was, I think I might have something I can't really tell, um, which always leads to the same thing we do right now. So I can't really tell, I think I'll drop a bomb on it. Uh, because, uh, because that's what people do. Um, it looks good, feels good, I have a target, it meets my criteria, I'm gonna bomb it which is exactly what we want them to do. And we want them to do that over and over and over again, only to find out that all that ordinance hasn't changed their strategic position one iota, which will lead them to realize that many of the things that they're attacking um, must not be real. And, uh, and, that is, and that is, we think, a key to how we get people who decide to go kinetic, how to, how to come back off because they'll realize that uh, it's, it's a losing proposition. Because the whole time they're doing all that, uh, we'll be inflicting 
significant uh, damage on their forces. Okay, um, that requires us to have, again, acoustic, uh, radar, and cyber countermeasures. And I'll leave it at that in this group. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is all about protecting things. Um, it, it's very, very hard to have perfect knowledge over a huge area of ocean. Um, it is entirely feasible at reasonable cost to have near perfect knowledge over a select piece of ocean. So that requires some coordination between ASW forces and keeping areas clear so that our strike groups uh, know where they can and where they cannot have freedom of maneuver. And then the strike group commander can match where he has freedom of maneuver with where he needs to be to do his mission. And, and we will uh, keep those forces uh, very much in the game. And uh, again, as I said before, uh, there, there are other things that are also very important that we know what is going on around them. And, uh, and we're going to maintain the ability or grow the ability to do that in many, many cases uh, using unmanned systems. Okay, in the next uh, page, I've talked to that somewhat already, but that is um, pulling together everything from the most exquisite national technical means uh, down to unclassified information, uh, sharing it amongst all of our key decision makers, allowing us to rapidly converge on decisions in, in a short period of time, uh, looking at the same picture so we can facilitate that conversation. And next slide. So I want to dwell on this one a little bit. Uh, this is, I think, the, this is the Washington, D.C. battlefield. So if you look in the outer ring there, you can see this, that's our platform programs. And, you know, we're in the nuclear submarine business, and platforms of that complexity necessarily take many years, really over a decade, to design and build uh, because of the level and types of technology and because of the types of uh, exquisite safeguards that we need to ensure that are a part of that process at every step of the way. And we're pretty good at that, actually. And, uh, and we want to sort of keep that going about the same. But it also requires a, a, a constant level of effort. For example, to sustain our strategic deterrent, we have to stay on the path that we're on right now, and we can't afford any bumps in the road due to things like sequestration or other, you know, budget battles here. We need to have a predictable future for our industry partners so they can acquire the materials and the workforce for the long-term commitment that is shipbuilding. That's how it has to happen. We can help them through things like block purchases of submarines so they have a, they and their suppliers uh, can, can work their future, but we can't do 10-year programs with uh, one-year uncertainty in funding. In the next circle, the yellow circle, is where we start talking about vehicles. And in many cases, the vehicles have to work to a uh, single-digit year's timeline. Uh, we have to uh, make them change to impose uh, new quandaries for our adversaries. Uh, we have to make them change sometimes to adapt to the quandaries that our adversaries present us. And, and we can physically do this. Um, I mentioned before we have some issues with, uh, with uh, JSID's milestones, so we have to define our programs right. We have issues in the testing arena. You know, we did a software change not too long ago to make sure we could accommodate a, a new uh, threat that was presented to us. And we got that change done in about five months, along with some significant in-house testing. But the external testing regime uh, that we go through uh, wanted us to do 165 in-water shots uh, to prove that this little software change we made in one segment of the program um, was good to go. 165 shots, that's almost a year's worth of training shots for the submarine force. Uh, we, we can't do business that way. We have to leverage modeling and simulation. We have to have people who are knowledgeable 
in software to recognize that this module does not affect all those other modules, and we need to keep that pace of change uh, going. Uh, we also have to learn how to uh, define our programs. I, I, I learned a lot by studying naval aviation and, and this, uh, this little change they made to the Hornet to turn it into the Super Hornet, um, which of course is in, in effect an entirely different and vastly superior aircraft in every respect. Uh, so we're following that lead. I make no apologies for it as we do our heavyweight torpedo restart, is what we're calling it, so we can sustain our weapons inventory. And that restart is going to open our production line, uh, but that production line will be uh, tied to an innovation effort that will parallel what we do with the combat systems on the submarines, where every, every, uh, every other year we come up with what we call a technical insertion, and in the years between that, we do a software change so that our, we can continuously evolve, but keep the program name the same. Similarly, if we're doing things like unmanned air vehicles, which is really, you could say, it's really an imaging system to support the way the submarine operates. Well, our combat system has an imaging subsystem. So the worst thing we could do to move quickly would be to define the unmanned air vehicle as a new program. Rather, we should define it as an extension of the combat system. It's a technical insertion, so to speak. And I'm not doing this to be, to be uh, devious. If, if I was, I wouldn't be telling you all. Um, I'm simply looking at what is the capability I need to deliver and what are the uh, what are the hurdles that I have to face, and how can I overcome those hurdles? And that's why we come up with some things that just might not make sense if you didn't deal with that whole picture. Is this making sense here? Okay, um, and then on to the right, the timelines get shorter and shorter because sometimes we need to do a software change very quickly. You get a new radar, we get a new countermeasure, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, as as we continuously learn working with, with the SEALs, as we, we're doing some pretty good work with them recently, uh, with them helping us uh, with our unmanned vehicles because we're working on, in the long term on these fancy things that, that, uh, you know, that put the vehicle in the water and get it back. But until that day comes, we have Navy SEALs, the most adaptable ocean interface in the world. They chuck them out of the dry deck shelter, and then when they come back, they, we put a buoy up and they catch them and we, we bring them back in. And, uh, but in the process of, of that interaction we have, they say, well, if we can put this thing out, they have a bunch of other stuff they'd like to put out through that same dry deck shelter. So as we compare notes with each other, we learn a lot from each other. Okay, next slide. I'd like, like to talk uh, briefly um, uh, in case you think that this strategy is, you know, PowerPoint deep, as we say, about just a few things that we've done recently to, to make, uh, to, to show how quickly we can innovate if, if people let us. And so uh, we have this thing called the Fleet Modular Autonomous Undersea Vehicle, which, uh, which we're doing with missions with as we speak. And uh, we didn't create this program out of whole cloth. We looked around at what the academic world and the ocean and gas, uh, the oil and gas industry were doing. And we took some vehicles that worked just fine and we adapted them for our purposes, and they're very good, uh, very reliable. They have thousands and thousands of mission hours on them before we even started using them. And then we looked at the unique things that we need. Well, one of the things we need is the ability to do high-speed data transfer through the water. So we've got some folks to do some work and had some good success recently with uh, high-speed underwater laser modems. So what does that mean to me? Well, it means if I launch a unmanned vehicle from a submarine that cannot recover it, I can get the information that it determined on its mission. Even if I don't get the vehicle back, I get the most important thing, which is the information. In the uh, right-hand side there, you can see the, uh, you see a torpedo. You can see that it's modular, and in the lower right, you can see the, uh, one of our deve developmental engines that, uh, that gives us more than 100 miles of range. In the center, you see a, uh, a dispenser where one vehicle can drop many, many payloads. The payload in the picture 
is an acoustic training device that we can program for the, for we'll just say the type of sound that we want, um, and we can put that uh, where we need it. It can look like us, it can look like somebody else, it's good stuff. In the, uh, in the lower left, not all the way to the left, but the, uh, there's a couple of pictures there that show the thing floating in the water. I want to tell just a short story about that. For my entire life, I have wanted to have a periscope decoy, just so I could mess with people, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and I had this idea that, that there would be this thing that we would launch out and it'd be a vehicle and the mass would come up and go down. And I went up to Newport, Rhode Island to the Undersea Warfare Center up there and I, I asked them if they could build something like that. And, uh, and as, as, in as kind of words as they could find, they said, we could, but that would be really stupid. <laughs> Not their exact words, but I caught their drift. And it was stupid, they said, because um, in a much more elegant fashion, it's, we don't need to have a, a periscope. You know, we need to have something that looks like a periscope to people who are looking for periscopes. And so what it really came down to is, is can you give the right radar return at the right times? It might make someone think, hey, there's a... There's something there, I don't see anything. It must be a submarine, it's gone. It's back again. That, that's the types of decisions that people go through when they decide that there's a submarine out there. And, uh, and maybe even they need to make it look like it's moving a little bit. Uh, not too fast, just a little bit. And, uh, and then the real brilliance began when uh, the guy from Newark who got the project, before he did one piece of work is he called his buddy in Ohio at the Air Force Research Lab, and he said, you got something like this? And he said, I do, but it looks like it's going 600 knots. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but, but not to worry, that's digits, we can change that. And next thing you know, the card gets dropped in FedEx and uh, a couple of short time later, we have something working on a boat in Rhode Island, and about a month after that, we have that thing in the buoy uh, that you see floating off of San Clemente Island. And, um, and I won't say uh, whose radar display that is, but it's not ours, and it looks pretty good. And uh, so anyway, but this is the type of thing we need the creativity to do and implement quickly. And those types of uh, decoys, they cost a little less than $3,000. So if I can make people drop million dollar torpedoes on $3,000 things that look like submarines, uh, we're on the right side of this asymmetric business. And when you leverage that with the ambiguity of do I have a submarine or not, and the capability that you must worry about if there are submarines in a certain place, um, this is how we start getting to this, this deterrent, the deterrence, conventional deterrence theory where we can make an adversary realize that the cost of going to war at sea with us is going to be severe. Is this making sense to you? Okay, and then next uh, is really just a drill down on this uh, fleet modular AUV, which starts with uh, something the oceanographers used is a program already. So we add a few things to their program, like the, the laser comms to download the information. Um, better batteries, you know, we had a bad experience a few years ago with lithium ion batteries on a submarine, uh, but we've got projects to make sure that the technology gets better. Industry is helping us, you know, uh, uh, Elon Musk wants to put a huge lithium ion battery in everybody's garage, so, so now I'm going to have this huge test bed, you know, if, if houses don't start blowing up all over the country in the next two years, <laughs> we're going to know that we have mastered some lithium ion battery technology. So, you know, and we need to have an open enough mind to say that if that is good enough to put in your house, it's probably good enough to, to go in an unmanned vehicle. Okay, um, next slide. So that's it at a very high level. Uh, we think we have a, a strategy that is coherent, that is effective, that uh, meshes with the uh, larger needs of, of the national strategy. And with that, I think uh, Dr. Hicks and I are going to sit and take any of your questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Please. We have a
next year. Yeah. Well, first, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Lockheed Martin for putting on um, this event with us today, and of course, to our partners at U.S. Naval Institute and uh, Admiral Daly in particular. Uh, Vice Admiral Connor, those were fantastic remarks, um, and I just want to get your sense, and just starting off, we have an announcement just yesterday of a new CNO nominee. He is a submariner, second in a row. We've heard a lot from you this morning about really the creativity and the incredible asymmetric advantage that submarines offer us. Uh, any takeaway there in terms of how the Navy might be thinking about its future, that it's going back to the well, if you will, in terms of the submarine force and, and maybe how the submarines figure into the overall Navy picture? Sure. I, I wouldn't read, uh, I think some people might read the selection of Admiral Richardson as being CNO as a, as a submarine force victory or something like that. It, it's a victory for the Navy, period. Uh, he is not parochial. Um, he has spent the last three years working on submarines and aircraft carriers. Um, he spends time working on the overall effectiveness of the Navy mission. Um, some of you have seen some of the work he's done on, on working to just sort of uh, uh, polish up the, the character of the Navy to make sure we focus on integrity. So um, we really do, you know, when I'm the submarine force commander, uh, I'm a I'm an advocate for the submarine force, uh, but but you know, last time I worked with you, I was doing doing overall war fighting. Uh, Admiral Richardson does overall war fighting, so I just wouldn't read the warfare pen of the chief of naval operations. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into that because he is not going to neglect the surface forces. He will not neglect aviation, the mine warfare. He, he will do his best to strike uh, the right balance based on warfare effectiveness, not based on warfare community. Well, since you answered that so politely, I'll push you on, uh, on the same topic a different way. How well do you feel in your current position advocating, as you say, on behalf of the submarine force with the attributes of the submarine forces you've laid out today in terms of the asymmetric advantage that the force offers? How well do you think that message is heard and understood on Capitol Hill and in the Pentagon beyond the submarine force? Sure. So I am paid to be a shameless advocate for the submarine <laughs> force. And, uh, but uh, I, I believe our, our message is being heard on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, we, we, we have good support from the, uh, from the, the especially the House Armed Services uh, Committee, CPAR subcommittee. Uh, they have invested a lot of their time in, in learning uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, uh, I think a lot of you have seen where Chairman Forbes is, is very much invested in what is the Navy's strategy. Um, I have sat down with people like him and, and others on the committee to, uh, to go through this, to, to have a, a dialogue about it. And, and what they really want to know is they want to know that we have a strategy. Um, and, and as I said before, we're, we're in a point in time with the current state of anti-access area denial, we're almost everybody in a position of responsibility who has studied the problem, has wargamed the problem, uh, recognizes the value of, of what we do. So uh, that is helping us get uh, good support. So I'm, I'm very thankful for the support that we get. And you mentioned this brief window in which to get in front of the problem, if you will, or get on top of the problem. There are m many pieces to that, from technology to con ops, obviously the funding, where are you, what worries you the most in terms of the confidence level that we can exploit this window? Uh, I have, the, I think, the same worry that everyone else has is that we will have a, uh, a uh, predictable budget environment uh, through which we can make the proper investments over time. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, we are lucky in that our construction program for the Virginia is healthy. Uh, we're coming up on the uh, growth years of the production program for, for a higher replacement. So if we don't have, have uh, stability in, in defense budgets and, and overall national budgets that, that are viable, um, that's not going to happen. Um, as we try to introduce new capabilities, which we believe are necessary to stay ahead, to sustain our dominance, if every time we come up with a new idea, 
it gets run through the filter of, well, this is a new start. And although we gave you some funding this year and the total numbers are right, the method by which we gave you the funding doesn't allow new starts. If there's no new starts, there's potentially no new ideas. And if there's no new ideas, we lose. That, that's the message, uh, message I'd like to get across. You spoke quite a bit this morning on the theme of innovation without necessarily uh, using that wording. Um, and certainly, you know, working on using creativity, which you did use as a word, to, to work through operational problems. That's a theme that Secretary Carter has been out to Silicon Valley on. Certainly, we've had Deputy Secretary Work talk about the third offset strategy. Um, you know, what are the lessons that the submarine community can bring to others? Uh, not that others don't have lessons themselves, but what do you think has been successful in terms of the ability to be creative and stay on top of operational challenges? And where are you looking to do better? The, uh, sort of the, the poster child that I would say is for how you uh, create an environment that, that enables creativity is, is the thing we have in the combat system right now. It, it's the uh, technical insertion slash advanced processor build strategy where, where every year we invite people from industry who think they have good ideas to propose those ideas to the folks at, at uh, Naval Sea Systems Command or the Integrated Warfare Systems Directorate in particular. And then what they do is they compete the ideas. They, they compete the technologies and methodologies and, and, they, and they pick winners. So it, it's got kind of this venture capital feel to it. And then when they pick the thing that works, they hand it over to uh, the integrator who, who integrates it within the system. And, and that's how we've been able to have a, a long period of rapid evolution in the combat system. We don't do that everywhere. Uh, we're, as I mentioned, we're bringing that into our torpedo world. Um, the, the surface combat systems are bringing it in. Um, I've been working this for a, while, for a while now through what they call the ACB program, and it's having a similar impact there. So we know how to do this. Uh, we just need to make sure we create the environment to do it, that we uh, don't define a new idea as a new start, and then that we look at um, how much testing is required uh, versus how much is desired by the system until every bureaucrat is happy. Not necessarily the same thing. Very good. I'm only going to ask one more question because we have a great deal of maritime knowledge in the audience. We want to leave time for them to ask questions as well. Um, also yesterday, which was a busy day, uh, Secretary Mavis was up at the Naval Academy and gave a talk, and he <coughs> spoke at one point in his speech, I believe his phrasing was something along the lines that all insignia are now available to women uh, with the exception of the Trident. And of course, we've got the enlisted women. We've had officers, now we have enlisted women coming um, through submarine billets. Can you just briefly talk about where you are in that process and sure. milestones? Sure. We, we have uh, uh, somewhat over 100 uh, women officers in, in the submarine force now uh, at every stage, whether it's initial training. Uh, on their junior officer sea tour, they've completed the junior officer sea tour and they're now working ashore. Uh, we're just now, I'm happy to say, starting to get some of those women to uh, agree to stay on for a department head tour. So, uh, so it, it's going well. Um, the, the average woman that we have in the submarine force, the average woman is an above average performer, um, which actually makes sense if you, if you do the math and look at how competitive it was for the number of women who applied to get in the number of slots we had available, uh, they're, they're supremely talented, and, uh, and the, the experience we've had with them at sea has, has borne that out. We're just now at the cusp of enlisted women in submarines, and we just had a selection board um, about two weeks ago. And let me just describe the process a little bit. Our, a lot of study, lessons learned from other communities have suggested that when, when you bring when you want to bring women into a group, um, you, you should bring them in, in, in a very in a, in a way that that uh, no one feels alone and isolated. Which which is easy to do, you know. I mean, a sailor on their first sea tour can feel alone and isolated anyhow. And, and so what we're trying to do is we're bringing in 
we've, we've just recruited a group of very outstanding senior enlisted women who have multiple sea tours of experience that will now go to the submarines. And then when we bring the other women in from the training, uh, they will have this senior mentor who can explain to them um, when, that this is a part of life at sea, uh, this is okay, or hey, this is not okay and you should not put up with this. And, and we think that this will go a long way towards uh, uh, increasing the, 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 uh, the confidence that they have, the safety that they feel on, on the ship. And, and just, it really does make a big difference, we've learned, if, if you, to, to have a mentor, uh, if you're a young woman, it's very good if there's an older, more experienced woman that you can talk to about whatever you want to talk about. So that's, that's the method behind it. Uh, we did that to a certain degree with the officers by bringing in supply officers who had at least one, maybe two sea tours. And so we're, uh, we're looking for the same results here. Okay, we're going to open it up to the audience. We do have a microphone, so if you raise your hand, if you have a question, uh, we will walk the microphone to you. We ask you to tell us your name and your affiliation if you have one. This one right here. Admiral Bjorn Egenberg, Naval Attaché for Norway. Uh, and Norway is in the process of buying new submarines, and for our it will be the kind of Ohio replacement equivalent. So uh, what kind of role do you see for a conventional submarine in the future? What can the allied nations bring to the table regarding undersea dominance in the future? I think we should look at uh, complementary capabilities. Um, the Norwegian Navy uh, submarine force is renowned uh, for their ability to operate in the areas in and around uh, Norway, which are uniquely challenging, as, as you know. And, uh, and they're suited to a, a smaller submarine than what we have. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have to go as far to get to what the, their mission area would be. So that opens up uh, uh, conventional opportunities, maybe supplemented by uh, AIP and so forth. So I, I think there's a lot of as we work with allies, we should look at things like that. When we look in the Western Pacific, uh, we have some skill sets. We can move from fight to fight. Um, our Japanese partners uh, uh, have conventional submarines that are very, very good. Um, but there's some areas in and around the Western Pacific that, that they're very well suited to where they don't have to cover the distance that we do. So uh, I think it's important that we be complementary, that we be compatible uh, one of the big challenges of NATO is, uh, if you go back to my uh, staying on the same page slide, uh, communications is, is a big challenge, uh, uh, enabling our NATO partners to communicate at, with the uh, speed with which we do. Uh, but in a fast moving fight, anything we can do to communicate uh, as quickly between countries as we do within the U.S. would be very, very helpful. So all the way in the back there. Thanks. It's Tom Schenker with the New York Times. Appreciate your comments today, Admiral. Uh, can you look at Russian capabilities and give us your assessment of their submarine fleet in the Pacific and Western Pacific? What are their prior priorities for investment? Uh, what are you most worried about, and what do you need to counter? Thank you. The, the uh, so you know, Russian capability after a uh, a long uh, holiday is, is coming back. Uh, they have some very good platforms in their uh, Severed Bensk. SSGN, um, it is it's fairly quiet. I'd say I'd say it's very quiet, um, and, and they're back into the uh, with their Dolgoruki SSBN and their Bulava missile system. They're uh, they're on the cusp of a continuous at sea strategic deterrent, uh, something they fell off of for many years, and you're going to see. Uh, we think we're going to see part of that. Uh, of the Dolgoruki class to show up in the Northwest Pacific pretty soon. So that's an area where they've been, uh, they've been pretty slow for a long time out there, but they're, but they're coming back. Another on the aisle. Admiral, hi. Tate Nurkin with IHS Janes. Uh, thanks very much for your comments today. Uh, at the end, you mentioned the FMAUV. As a, as a critical ve uh, vehicle for, uh, for execution of this strategy. I'd be curious on your broader comments about unmanned systems and unmanned undersea systems in particular, both as an enabler of the strategy that you've articulated and also as uh, a challenge that you may face 
in the undersea environment as these uh, systems uh, proliferate. So, so the, uh, the unmanned vehicle is, uh, is both opportunity and challenge. I think the proliferation of unmanned vehicles uh, will go geometric uh, in the very near future uh, as the uh, ability to execute the autonomy, uh, as, as we can execute that autonomy with, with more confidence, as we make uh, incremental improvements in uh, power density and so forth, and, and we learn, uh, we get a little more skillful in using the power density that we have. You know, sometimes we think that uh, we always have to be driving through the water, and, and we need to measure our uh, endurance as the, you know, how far we go or how fast we can keep the, the screw turning. In, in many cases, it's about getting to the right place and, and staying there, uh, and then coming back, maybe. And, and as, so as we learn to adapt our, our tactics, techniques, and procedures to the capabilities we have as we evolve new capabilities, I, I think you're going to see a huge, uh, huge uh, opportunity there. This is all happening in parallel with the, with the types of, uh, of, uh, of packages that you might want to carry on an unmanned vehicle. Uh, you can do things with smaller and smaller devices that take uh, less and less power over time. And so that is also uh, increasing uh, what we can do. So, so there's a huge opportunity here. Um, the parallel is, um, you know, most of what, what you can imagine to do, um, pretty much anyone can imagine to do it, and the barriers to people doing some of that stuff are relatively low. And so we need to keep in mind how they might, uh, how others might use them, and uh, and that gets back to that very dynamic uh, field of play where we can't be figuring out what to do over periods that take uh, many, many years. Yeah, we have time for one more question. We have one right up in the front here. Sir, Major Ted Zagrinisky on the Army staff at the Pentagon. I have a question for you about sort of the broader thrust of the presentation that you made today. So you've articulated a very interesting set of desired future ways and means. And I'm curious to what extent you believe as you cast uh, subforce capabilities into the future, does this sort of necessitate a thoroughgoing reinvention of how the US Navy applies its sea power under the waves? Or are we looking at submarines essentially doing what they do now, but getting faster? Thank you. I think what we see uh, coming is, is, the, uh, is the submarine will be doing things that either only can be done or that we're only willing to do with a man in the loop, for example. And, and perhaps maybe backstopping uh, a bunch of other uh, devices. Maybe we'll be spending a lot of time getting unmanned devices to the fight because we have lots of power density and energy and we can get them 99.9% of, of the way to where they have to go and then there's some places even we won't go and so we would, we would send them in uh, for that part. Um, I, don't, I don't see the, uh, the unmanned vehicle uh, replacing the submarine. Uh, there, were, there were far more things that we need to do um, than we can possibly do with the submarines we have or even with the submarines we could possibly expect to build. Uh, so that requires us to, to look at um, other ways to do it with these more disposable technologies, either because of cost or risk. Uh, so that's pretty much how I see it. Vice Admiral Connor, you've been very generous with your time today. It's great to see you, and um, it's great to see what you're doing for the Navy and for the country. So thank you all. Okay, uh, thank please you. join me in thanking them.